everybody. I'd like you to welcome you to this presentation. My name is Dr. Liz Musil, and today we're going to talk about developing research conclusions. According to a group called Sense About Science, scientific journals publish more than a million research papers every year. That number refers only to academic papers. The number of articles published in general magazines and all of the blogs scattered across the web full of trends and statistics that are supposed to be based in science are uncountable. With so much material floating around, it can sometimes be tough to distinguish who is providing valuable information and who is just throwing around an uninformed opinion. The point of designing a research study is to collect data to be analyzed so that you can draw a conclusion. Analyzing data involves comparing the independent and dependent variables of your study to see if there's any relationships and then seeing if those results can give you more information about the original research question or hypothesis. We will look more closely at how you develop a conclusion based on your findings and then how you go about reporting these findings in a way that meets the criteria of the scientific community. What is the point of investigating a problem if you don't share your results with the world? As you analyze data, you are synthesizing all the information that you've gathered so that you can deliver a conclusion about your research. Ultimately, you will present your conclusions to a larger audience. In the scientific community, you publish research papers in a peer-reviewed scholarly journal. Essentially, you write a conclusion to answer the original question that launched the whole study. The following questions can guide you as you write a conclusion. What did you learn by looking at your data and statistics? How do the data and statistics relate to the original research question? Do your results confirm or disprove of your hypothesis? What is the significance of your results? Are they consistent with other studies? Did they produce new and useful information? Did the independent variable cause any specific changes that affect the dependent variable? How do your results apply to the real world? What field do your results apply to and how do they add understanding about the field? Who will be interested in your results? Students, researchers, professionals, businesses? What new questions come up? What would you do differently to improve the study? What other research questions would you suggest that others investigate? Study generalization or generalizability and validation. Your conclusion should also show how you can generalize the relationships between variables that is the cause and effects to a larger group in the real world. This concept is known as study generali generalizability, generalization. I can't pronounce it correctly, I'm, I apologize. When we design a study where we can make generalizations, the study is externally valid, which will be important when we send our work for others to review. When we design a study that reduces confusing or unnecessary variables, it is internally valid. As you build your conclusions, be sure to include the ways that you designed a valid study and how your data supports your claim to authenticity. One significant area that supports validity is to describe your sample population. In your conclusion, you explain how your chosen study group contains enough participants to give you accurate results. The bigger the sample size, the more precisely your results will be, and the more easily you can generalize your findings. When a sample size is too small, you risk making your results insignificant, or significant only to the members of your study. One approach to choosing an appropriate sample is to use a sampling model. You identify the larger population to which you hope to generalize your study results, and then you choose a sample from that particular group and perform your study with a smaller sample. The logic behind this approach is then when your sample represents a portion of your goal population, you can automatically generalize results back to that goal group. Of course, some flaws arise with this approach. You're choosing the specific group 
your results will affect, but your findings may not support this assumption. Also, you may not be able to collect enough participants and therefore enough data for a fair sample. To express the internal validity of your study, you need to show evidence that you designed the study with adequate control over data gathering methods. Control is very important to the internal validity and research in general. Your primary concern is to make sure that when you test a theory or a hypothesis, you change only one aspect of the study at a time. That way you can indicate with certainty that a single change was the only possible, possible cause of the results you observe and measure. In your conclusion, you will show that you set up your study to remove all outside influences, which allows you to see changes more clearly. But remember that just because you've done everything right and controlled the study correctly doesn't mean that you will see any meaningful changes. Your ability to control an experiment. The list that we have right here expresses some of the outside influences that affect your ability con to control an experiment. A thorough conclusion will address these influences and explain how they're impacted the variables in the study, as well as your results. History. Especially when you're working with people as study subjects, you have to be aware of how events happening outside of the study may affect participants' response to questions in an experiment or how they respond to changes. Outside influences can even be events that happen in the news. Maturation. Your subjects may change during your study and that change can affect your results. As the word suggests, people mature, so their behavior, attitudes, and tastes can mature as well. Lost participants. You may begin a study with more participants than you end with, and you need to address the effect of this attrition and what it has on your results. For example, you may lose a group of athletes because they do not have the time to complete your survey, and you need to understand what kind of data you lose when you do not have the information from this segment of the population. Also, remember, if you don't have a large enough sample size, then your results may be invalid, and you may have to conduct the study again. Choosing the wrong question or equipment. You may realize that as your study progresses, or as you analyze data that you've studied, the wrong variables in relation to your research question have been used. Again, if this problem arises, you need to start all over. Selecting participants based on convenience. Selection bias happens when you choose only people for your study because they're easy to find, and some portion of your sample will likely fall into this category. It's a common issue, and you need to address this influence as you discuss your results. And then there's the Hawthorne effect. When people know they are in an experiment, their behavior may change. Or if subjects cannot maintain their anonymity, they may provide different answers on a survey. To prepare to write a final conclusion of your report, you need to write out the research question, list all of your dependent variables, and then list your results and statistics. Finally, you outline the ways that your study design and methodology meet and must address any issues of reliability as well as internal and external validity. Using statistical modes to support conclusions. Statistical modes and models, such as graphs, charts, and diagrams, provide an important tool to help us draw credible conclusions. We use statistics to describe numeric data and make predictions about behaviors and events. To put a human face on this idea, people give us information and we generate statistics using those numbers to guess how people's past choices and actions will affect their future behavior. A statistical model gives us a visual illustration of the relationships between our numeric results and our study variables. That is, we clearly see the answers to our research questions by looking at the model we have set up. 
A statistical model also can show how variables connect to each other because we can sort data into categories and build a form of visual evidence. We refer to our statistical models to provide the following information for our conclusions. To put numbers into categories so we can describe measurements. To show how a process works as with diagrams and flowcharts. To give estimates about observations and to predict future behavior. It is important to emphasize that a statistical model is a visual idea that helps us better understand real-world systems. It represents a concept of the real world, but it does not represent the real world. These models help us find patterns in data and highlight the relationships between data sets. When we see patterns and relationships clearly, we have a tool that helps us draw conclusions. Peer review. After all the research is done and you've drawn your conclusions, you can't just throw a paper out into the world and see if it sticks. There is a process of peer review that further validates the quality of your research. A panel of experts in your field of research examine your work and review it to determine whether or not your research meets professional standards. The concept of peer review has been around for centuries in the scientific world. Every scientific theory was penned at some point as a research paper and then distributed for critique to the scientific community. For example, Einstein presented his theory of general relativity in a research paper in 1920. The point of peer review is to keep the researchers honest. You don't hand over your work to an academic journal or publisher because you like seeing your name in print. It's not about popularity. It's about presenting your findings in a respected forum. Unlike many sites on the internet where anyone with an opinion can dish out their views, academic journals and publications set standards for the materials that appear in their pages. What happens when you send your work to be reviewed? A team of people sit down and examine your research paper and ask the following questions. One, is the science valid? The team of reviewers will look for any errors in the design, methodology, and findings in the research project. Is the study significant? As the team evaluates the report, they determine whether your findings are important to their field. Is the work original? If the review team determines that the findings are important, they will also judge that the report has a unique message to add to the scientific community. Based on the answers to the above questions, your review team send their recommendations to the editor of the scientific journal to publish your paper or to reject it. Note, however, that a rejection does not always mean that a paper is completely dismissed. Sometimes reviewers will feel that a study is important but needs to be improved in certain areas. An article that has passed peer review typically contains the following elements. An abstract, which is a short description similar to the problem statement. Sections that cover the introduction, methodology, results, and conclusions. Statistical models such as charts, tables, and graphs. Language that is appropriate to and specific to that research field. Citations in the text as footnotes, endnotes, reference lists, and a bibliography that fully integrates and outlines sources of external research for the paper. Other types of review. There are different types of review as well. The traditional and most common review is the single blind review, where reviewers know the author's name, but the author does not know who the reviewers are. In a double blind review, no one knows anyone's name. The reviewers receive a report that is stripped of all identifying information and the author. Why keep identities secret? These people aren't superheroes after all. For the single blind review, it lets the reviewers give their full comments freely without worrying that the author will be personally upset with them and come after them. For the double blind review, when the reviewers don't know who the author of the paper is, then they will not be biased by any preconceived notions they have about a particular person or the work they've done, and they can judge a research paper on its own merit. There is one more peer review approach, and that's the open review, where all parties know who's coming to the table. 
The benefit of this type of review is that when the author knows who the reviewers are, the reviewers may feel compelled by peer pressure to give a careful critique. In summary, peer review, however, is not a guarantee against bad information. While there are highly regarded journals, there's also obscure publishers and websites with weak standards. There's a hierarchy in the scientific world, which is to say that it doesn't matter if you published a paper, it matters where you published it. At the top of the hierarchy are prestigious journals run by professional associations, and at the bottom are the hierarchy of the many, many journals that will publish almost anything. This concludes our lesson and presentation. Thank you so much for your time and attention.